This is Theater 191. This lecture is on heightened language and Shakespeare. I'm Dr. Christiana Moldrum Harkilich. In Module 3, we're talking about Shakespeare, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time breaking down what iambic pentameter means, how to read it, and how to understand Shakespeare's basic act structure. To begin with, we're going to start with the to be or not to be speech from Hamlet Act 3, Scene 1. So here we have the text of to be or not to be. This is a soliloquy, which means it is a speech given directly to the audience. It is Act 3. Uh, Hamlet is making a big decision, and he says the speech, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. That whole first sentence that I just said is the first complete thought in the speech. In Shakespeare, unlike in uh, more contemporary plays, all text is subtext. You'll watch a video a little bit later about the differences between text and subtext, but in Shakespeare, every character tells you exactly what they mean. Um, there's nothing underlying that you're telling you exactly what's going on. So we have this first thought, and it is in iambic pentameter. Not all of Shakespeare is in verse. Uh, some of it is in what we would call prose or everyday speech. It's not set to meter. But iambic pentameter, which means there are 10, uh, 10 beats in the phrase. Each line has 10. Uh, and iambic is the I am, da-da. That's the, the way to think of it, right? The stress is on the second syllable. Um, you can sort of think of iambic pentameter as a heartbeat. So, but um, but um, but um, but um, but um, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. Now, if we're thinking about, uh, we have a, a what we would call a feminine ending at the end of this. There's an extra syllable. Uh, so instead of to be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, we have sort of a little bit extra. But of course, to be or not to be, that is the question does not end with a period. Each line in uh, verse gets a capital, so that's not a good way to think about where does the, the thought begin and end. You want to think about what is the full thought that they are saying. And as you'll see in this uh, particular text, right, we have a continuation uh, of the thought over each line. Each line is not a, a single thought. Sometimes that happens, right? Um, but for the most part, the thoughts wrap around. So what do you do with that? Do you continue on one breath through the whole of that first thought, which might sound like this? To be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. It rushes it. Uh, we're not thinking the thoughts as we say them. And so you want to slow it down a little bit. You want to think about what you are saying, as I said, uh, wrote in the, the lecture, if you don't know what you mean, the audience will never know what you mean. So when we're thinking about to be or not to be, that is the question, beyond any interpretation, just honoring the verse, we want to make sure we have that cadence, that heartbeat, but um but um but um but um but um happening. So to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. To die to sleep. Uh, alongside original pronunciation, we have an idea of end line breathing that comes from original practices as well. And what happens in end line breathing is the idea that many actors uh, might not have been very literate. And so they would get their scripts and they would have to learn their lines very quickly. They would only get their lines and their cue parts, so they wouldn't get the full text as a whole. Uh, and in order to learn their lines, they might pay someone who was literate to read their lines to them one by one, and so they would be learning each line on its own. So it's helpful to think about the way that uh, you might take a breath at the end of every line, but that breath might not be the end of your thought. So how do you push through? How do you make those choices as you're going through the text, right? 
And this last line that we've been ending on, and by opposing end them to die to sleep, is a good uh, place to talk about that, right? Because if you take a breath at the period, right, and by opposing end them, to die to sleep, no more, and by asleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. And then we take a breath again. It breaks up the rhythm of the iambic pentameter by taking a breath there. If you don't take a breath, right, and you're taking a breath at the end of every line, so you're not running out of air, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them to die, to sleep, no more. And you can hear how the ideas change by taking the breath and the pauses in different places. And so people have lots of opinions about how to perform Shakespeare. And this is just one of the ideas. I personally put a, a decent amount of credence into at least learning your lines this way um, when you're acting Shakespeare, because it tells you something more about the script. Uh, Shakespeare wrote plays that are very actable and you'll uh, in the course of this module watch a lot of actors talk about how much they love to perform Shakespeare because he's done most of the work it's a matter of analyzing understanding interpreting and then performing the text the other thing to keep in mind um, in Shakespeare is that pretty much everything is either in opposition to something and so you want to play the oppositions those two ideas that are contrasting or it's a list um, and that's the majority of uh, Shakespearean text is either an opposition or a list, and we have both of those in this text, right? So, uh, to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come. And so you're playing on the what's and the ands and the ors. Uh, are, we have two ideas that, that run up against each other. and if you play those two things, we understand what the thought is. But we also have um, lists, right? <clears throat> so here we are with a list. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? Here we are. One, the oppressor's wrong. Two, the proud man's contumely. Three, the pangs of disprised love. Four, the law's delay. Five, the insolence of office. Six, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin, right? That is all one thought, but it's a list. And so those two things, right, playing the oppositions and playing the list, uh, gets you through the majority of Shakespearean text. And that's a little bit on hype language for today. <laughs>